Greetings, people. Part two on the hot topic of how to approach teaching as a second language, especially English in Japan and likely in other Asian countries. Let's get on with it. Okay, we're going to start with some suggestions to respond positively to the questions left unanswered in my previous video. Now, this topic is rather unspecific. It could cover a number of areas. But first, how well do our expectations match up with those of our students? We may be lucky enough to find ourselves in a class of students who actually came to study. Great. Then all we have to deal with is the culture clash. But we know that many students did not come to uni with a view to studying languages. So from our side, how do we deal with this positively? So if we're not lucky enough to have an enthusiastic class, then there really is a mismatch of purposes. You want to teach, and they have to find a way to get through 90 minutes without interacting with anything but their smartphones. Good luck with that. Personally, I try to use humour to gain their attention. And whenever possible, I recommend using content which is about them, about the students. They're interested in themselves after all. For example, instead of the ever dull, this is a pen, it's blue, why not have them open up those evil smartphones and show one another their photos? This is my friend from junior high school. She's crazy. Same grammar point, more interesting. One thing that can motivate all but the most negative students is having them share their personal experience, such as what they did last summer or an embarrassing experience they had. It's better than reading about some historical figure about whom they couldn't care less. Making it accessible in this case simply means that we need to be teaching structures that the students are able to understand and manipulate for communication, rather than a few discrete grammar points that they probably will never need after they've been tested. And strange? Again, it's the question of making the material stimulating. Having students use the present progressive, for example, by having them describe the actions of Mr. Bean, will get them much more involved than doing the same exercise using some dull pictures in a textbook. The next issue is a little more introspective. Although I like to use humour to gain the attention of my students, I need to be careful that humour does not become the purpose of the lesson. Lots of fun, not much learning. Again, the question of convenience. Some teachers are pretty good at giving the students writing assignments and then having them check each other's work. But if we're doing that so that we can sit at our desk and get our grading done, then we can't be surprised if they don't progress and if they continue to be negative about studying English. This topic was raised in the first video. It's about how much we understand about how much our students really understand. First, here are the same examples from the first video. Both are idiomatic forms and they do not carry the meaning that students will be familiar with from their school years. So as teachers, I think we need to be on the lookout for these difficulties and hone our sensitivity to them. We may be carelessly using such idioms ourselves. 
or they appear in the textbooks and we use them without checking our students' understanding. And anyone who has taught more than a little in Japan knows not to expect any questions for clarification from Japanese students. Now, another example of how difficult something apparently simple may be for them. Written, and these are fine, but when spoken naturally, my friend's busy, my friends are busy. All you have, especially in UK English, to indicate that friends is plural is a barely pronounced schwa. So that's another reason we need to develop our sensitivity to what makes things hard for the students. As mentioned in the first video, there exist very few instances where two forms will have an identical meaning. Take this example. I'm going to make dinner usually carries a somewhat different meaning than I'll make dinner. The former might be in response to the question, why can't you pick up the kids? And this would indicate that you already have your plan fixed. Conversely, I'll make dinner would indicate a spontaneous decision just after your partner has said, I'm going to pick up the kids. But many university students have no idea of the difference in meaning of these two forms. In fact, each one carries a number of other potential meanings. Now, to help students understand the correct uses, I would first suggest teaching them at quite different times, not together in one lesson, because that's pretty confusing, and then providing ample examples in context for each form, as in the enhanced input phase of a consciousness-raising lesson. As a believer in the power of pushed output to aid acquisition, I would encourage giving students plenty of practice in using the target language in some kind of context with close attention to meaning. On the same topic, it's common in many functions-based textbooks for the target language to be presented in a variety of registers or levels of formality. Here are examples on the topic of getting permission. While this is an excellent way to expand the student's communicative ability in various situations, it could also lead to some ambiguity as the students try to incorporate these ideas in their language development. Here, we are offering several ways to convey one kind of message, and the students may naturally only pick up one of the forms at best. The problem is, I don't have any very clear idea of how this could be fixed. Any suggestions? Please put it in the comment section. Some textbooks try to cram in as much as possible in the shortest space or shortest time. I would suggest that we have to be careful not to cause overload during the student's learning process. For example, by teaching new grammar forms and new vocabulary at the same time. Understanding both the meaning and structure of a new language point can be challenging enough. Why distract them with new vocabulary? And you can see all the vocabulary in this example is nice and easy. 
On the other hand, introducing new vocabulary can be done in context using some structures that they've recently studied. New words, familiar language form. But is that a lexical set, maybe? <sighs> when in our classrooms we use words like pronoun, register, or conjugate, we need to be very careful that the words we use don't become distractors themselves. Especially with lower level classes, we need to be very careful about the expressions we use, even in non-specialized English. For example, Whereabouts are you from then? Contains two distractors. Whereabouts and then. The first one will be completely unfamiliar to almost anyone below advanced level. And the second carries no valuable meaning. It just makes the key word from difficult to hear. On the other hand, some teachers may be tempted to use some kind of pidgin English, perhaps in an attempt to win over the students. Of course, this approach can only lead to confirming their incorrect understandings of the language. Not a good idea. Here is a topic of some contention among teachers, to peer edit or not to peer edit. Here's my take on the subject after trying it a few times. Unless your students are high intermediate or better, how can they be qualified to judge the work of their peers? Personally, if I was studying a foreign language, I would not be very keen for a person at my own level to be checking my work. In many cases, both students are going to miss the same language error, meaning that that error is more likely to be learned and to become incorporated into the student's interlanguage. Of course, there will be instances where a teacher can use an opportunity, judiciously, to have stronger students help weaker students. But for me, peer editing as a standard technique for most Asian universities is like the blind leading the blind. If you watched the first video on the topic of how difficult English is to learn, you will remember this particular sentence. And although it's very basic in meaning, it has a large number of elements which are not easy to manipulate. The answer to the question, however, is probably fairly simple, although there could be a number of more complicated answers. But this leads me to one major point concerning English especially over many other second languages. For many learners, question forms and negative forms remain far more complicated and confusing than most complex or compound affirmative sentences. Why? I think it involves the manipulation of sentence order and the introduction of auxiliary verbs. So what can help? First, this would help our students to understand the basic grammatical forms by initially providing them with a very substantial experience with input and output of affirmative sentences, well before going into the grammar of questions and negative forms. Through this exposure, students can become familiar with a wide range of grammatical forms and vocabulary, and become comfortable using the affirmative sentences. Consciousness raising exercises with enhanced input and then extensive reading could contribute very powerfully. Of course, the use of questions by teachers and in textbooks will be necessary and useful. But students 
will need clear and explicit instruction before being pushed to produce the negative and question forms. Of course, there's the objection that the lessons will fail to give students a chance to communicate meaningfully, and that's pretty much true. But in the meantime, if the students can be developing considerable confidence simply because they're not being asked to produce forms that are too demanding, I think those benefits will outweigh any deficiency of this approach. Also, this brings us back to the idea of personal storytelling, communicative and easy to follow for all involved, and mostly only requires affirmative sentences. What will be next then? Considering the learnability of negatives and questions, the negative forms are easier because there are fewer changes in sentence order. Next, there are so many points to be learned or relearned here, it's important to take it step by step, one grammatical form at a time. The verb to be only requires the insertion of not. And the same goes for modals, such as can or will or would. All very easy. And this works with the present progressive too. But the simple past and present tenses are much more difficult because of the sudden appearance apparently from nowhere, of the do auxiliary verb. However, the patterns created with do can already be seen in the earlier forms. This progression works for all kinds of question forms too. To see an example of this working in detail, please check out my video for students called Negatives, Yes, No, WH Questions Power Course. The link will come at the end of the video. And finally, this is the very last point. In spite of all our intellectual efforts to get it right, here is a thought about who we might want to be as educators. It's not my idea. It's totally plagiarized from something I heard from a TED talk in reference to musicians in an orchestra. And really finally, plagiarized and adjusted for our occupation, a positive thought. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Any comments, questions, I'll try to respond. I hope we can create a valuable dialogue on this topic. Please give me a thumbs up if you like the video, and I'll see you next time.